Thanks very much, Peter, and, and thanks to the organisers for inviting me. Um, it is a sure sign of advancing years when, when you get asked to give 10-year retrospective talks. Uh, but, but at least this isn't as bad as the 50-year retrospective talk I had to give for the Royal College of Pathologists meeting not so long ago. Um, uh, but anyway, here we go. Um, what I wanted also to say is that I learned something from the Samir's initial questions right at the very beginning of this meeting, which is that there's not a single intensivist in this room. So either I'm going to be preaching to the converted, or I can say what I like, I guess. Anyway, let's move on. So where were we in 2004? And you can see that I prepared my talk last year, not like Rosemary, who obviously did it this year. Um, and I've also chosen 2004 because it was also the year um, in which the first students for the British Society for Medical Mycology uh, UCL um, master's program uh, entered their, uh, their degree course. Um, and so it's been going for 10 years now. And there's a leaflet distributed on all of your seats. Please have a look at it. Um, if you're interested in mycology, um, then please think about the course. Um, or if you know someone who is, uh, then pass it on. OK, so where were we in 2004? Well, we knew about colonization. And in fact, we were celebrating the 10th anniversary of Pite's so-called, I suppose, seminal paper on candida colonization, uh, in which he took 29 patients um, and looked at the intensity of colonization at the number of sites that were colonized and showed that two or more contiguous sites um, correlated with risk of invasive candidal infection. It had a positive predictive value of 44%, which isn't great, um, but was very similar to what we already knew from 12 years previously from Joe Solomkin's study um, in which he showed in Cincinnati that about half his patients who had candidemia post-operatively were colonized at two or more contiguous sites. So there we were. We'd already gone 12 years. We hadn't learned a great deal more, but we had a little bit because Didier Pite took those patients and derived this um, corrected colonization index. So by tweaking the data to take account of the numbers of sites sampled and the intensity of colonization at those sites, was able to show that there was a, a very good discrimination in terms of this index between infected patients um, and those that were colonized. And so, albeit small numbers, this is the beginning of something which was more discriminatory. OK, so we knew about colonization. We understood it more. We knew it was about intensity. Uh, what about um, epidemiology? Well, at this time, we were seeing a whole load of studies coming out from around the world, um, which were much better studies of the epidemiology of candida infection, um, especially in terms of them being denominator-based, pro proper population denominator-based studies. And the British Society for Medical Mycology um, performed one of these studies, which has published it, just been published in 2003 at that time, and showed, like a number of these other studies, that the ITU setting was the main source, the major source, uh, for candida infection. OK, so we're beginning to appreciate that it wasn't all hematology patients. It's ITU, where we get most of our cases. But what about incidence in these patients? So I want to ask the first question, um, because this is the incidence which came out of that study, but also is an incidence in the UK which we've seen um, since then. It's remained fairly constant. Um, I appreciate there are speakers in the audience who come from different countries and may have different figures in their minds, but please would you think about what the incidence in critical care patients in the UK is. Um, either 0.1 to 1 per 1,000 admissions, 1 to 10 per 1,000 admissions, 1 to 10 per 100 admissions, or 10 to 100 per 1,000 admissions. Please vote now. OK. Well, actually, that's very good. Um, nearly 50% of you realize the true um, incidence of candidemia in the UK. It's interesting that there's, there's a difference between three and four, because those of you who are still awake after lunch will realize that the, those are exactly the same. Um, so one, one to 10 per 100 admissions is exactly the same as 10 to 100 per 1,000 admissions. But there you go. Um, maybe we need to wake up. Anyway, the good thing is that nearly half of you 
know the true incidence in the UK, um, which from the BSMM study was 7.4 per thousand admissions. Okay, now where does that fit? It fits in the middle of, well it doesn't fit in the middle, it fits towards the lower end of the incidence in the literature, which is between 1 and 94 per thousand admissions. Um, but it fits in well with um, uh, a number of studies from within Europe, such as this uh, large French ICU study, uh, where the incidence was 6.7 per thousand admissions. So, so very similar. We're fitting in there fairly well, I think. And I can tell you that the incidence, the UK incidence, uh, you'll see in, later on in my talk, uh, has remained fairly constant. So we know better epidemiology, we know about colonization, we also know a bit more about the organisms. In those days, 80% of these cases were due to Candida albicans. So just remember that figure for later on. Um, the incidence of cases due to Globrata, Parapsilosis, and Dubliniensis, uh, much, much lower, predominantly Candida albicans. And we know about the mortality. This is a very large 2,000 patient European study uh, performed around that time published around that time, and you can see um, that the intensive care unit patients here have a significantly higher mortality compared with the rest, um, along with solid tumor and hematological malignancy patients of over 40%. So we've defined the size of the problem and the significance of the problem pretty well, I think, by 2004. Uh, we also knew a bit more about risk factors. So why did these patients get candidemia. Uh, a number of studies were published. This is a large um, uh, surgical ICU study um, from the States, known as the NEMIS study. And you can see some well-defined risk factors, proper statistics done on these, um, in which acute renal failure, parental nutrition, and any surgery uh, were significantly uh, associated with an increased risk of uh, invasive uh, candidal infection. Uh, the surgery mattered because um, ENT surgery and, and neurosurgery were associated with a reduced risk. So it was more about abdominal surgery, as I'm sure many, many of you appreciate. Um, and it's good to know that antifungal medication is associated with a reduced risk of fungal infection. So antifungals do seem to make a difference. Paul, I don't know where you've gone. Oh, you're over there. I quite agree. And we also were introduced to the concept of invasive aspergillosis affecting patients in the ICU around about that time. I think until then, we'd blithely been thinking it was all about candida. Um, but here we are. Most of these studies have come from Belgium. And you can see in this particular study that the autopsy rate was around about 50%, which is why we have data from these, country, uh, from these studies in this country. Um, and if you do the maths on the data, you can s find that the incidence is around four per thousand admissions in this group of patients, in this particular group of patients. So about half, maybe, what we're seeing in the UK, but a lot less than, than other countries are seeing in terms of candida. Um, what you really uh, notice from this, and probably already know, is that nearly all of these patients were those dying with chronic pulmonary disease who had been treated with corticosteroids and mechanical ventilation. They tended to have been on the ITU for a fair while. They probably acquired their um, aspergillus infection there, or they may have been colonized when they came in. They were given steroids, they were ventilated for ages, and then they died of uh, aspergillosis. So a new concept there. So to summarize the position 10 years ago, we knew a lot about colonization, much better epidemiology, and understood risk factors much better, and we realized it wasn't all candida. But we didn't really know much in the way of what strategies to adopt to manage these patients. So, so we, we knew the problem, we didn't know how to manage them. And obviously, you can take the same approach for any infectious disease or infective disease. Um, you can try and prevent, you can try and preempt or use a diagnostic-based approach, as, as we probably should talk about, at least in the hematology patients. Uh, we can try empirical therapy, or we can use targeted therapy. Now, um, I'm not going to say anything about diagnostics or guidelines, so that really excludes uh, these two uh, strategies. 
And so I'm only, I can see my, uh, the speaker following on from me smiling, um, that I'm not going to talk about the things she's going to talk about. I'm going to talk about prophylaxis and empirical therapy next. So we start with prophylaxis. Um, there have been a number of studies in the last 10 years, uh, but also there have been a couple of very important uh, meta-analyses of these studies. Uh, the first one was from Cruciani in 2005, and what he and his colleagues did was to take uh, nine uh, randomized comparative control trials with about 12,000 patients and select those that had these risk factors, uh, CBCs, uh, TPN, uh, total parenteral nutrition being administered. Uh, they'd received broad-spectrum antibiotics, um, and they'd undergone surgery. So they did try and focus down on what we thought were high-risk patients. Um, however, these studies weren't great, and colonization data, for example, which we now think are important, were only reported in five of these trials, um, and there was a big variation in inclusion criteria, definition, and outcome measures. So it does, it does make this a rather weak um, meta-analysis. But nevertheless, um, the overall mortality was significantly less in the patients given azole prophylaxis overall. Oops. The Cochrane systematic review, which I guess a lot of people see as gold standard reviews, or may, maybe not all of them are, um, this is actually still the current um, Cochrane review um, from Jeff Playford in 2006. And he included uh, more studies in the meta-analysis, um, which now take in 1,600 patients. Um, but they are still um, mostly fluconazole and ketoconazole studies. And crunching the numbers showed that uh, overall, in terms of the fluconazole-treated uh, patients, the ones given fluconazole prophylaxis had a significant reduction in invasive fungal infections most of which, of course, were candida. Um, and that overall, in 11 out of these 12 trials, uh, there was a significant reduction in total mortality. So that was grouping ketoconazole and fluconazole together. Um, for fluconazole-treated patients alone, as it were, uh, that did not achieve significance. So it's slightly kind of fuzzy uh, outcome. But again, suggesting that prophylaxis in the intensive care unit setting has some role. Okay, so that's prophylaxis in two slides. I'm now going to show you empirical therapy in two slides. Um, uh, there has been a randomized controlled trial of empirical therapy in intensive care unit patients performed by uh, Mindy Schuster. And this took um, a mixture of patients, 270 of them, who had persistent fever despite administration of broad spectrum antibiotics. So the same criteria that we, mean, that we use when we mean empirical therapy uh, in hematology patients. Um, they also selected the patients who had central lines in and a, a moderately raised, at least, Apache 2 score, so moderately severely ill. Um, and they used um, IV fluconazole at a high dose or placebo for two weeks and then followed up the patients for four weeks. Um, in terms of success, there was a composite endpoint, so it always makes things tricky. Um, but you had to resolve your fever, have no invasive fungal disease, not con continue the fluconazole because of toxicity, and have no need for a non-study systemic antifungal medication. Relatively straightforward. And these are all the outcome measures compared between the pale blue flu fluconazole patients and the dark blue placebo. And you can see there's no difference in response rate overall, no significant difference there, um, and actually uh, no difference in persistent fever, no difference, um, significant difference in invasive candidal infection, um, and no difference in adverse effects, although the placebo-treated patients did have more adverse effects. So just be careful out there when you're using placebo. Just bear in mind the adverse effects. So, Empirical therapy in the ICU setting has no evidence for its benefit. Um, we need to do more than that. And prof prophylaxis may work, but again, surely we need to be trying to focus how we use antifungals um, in uh, the ICU. Uh, 
And so a number of uh, units, a number of uh, groups have come up with so-called prediction rules in which one uses um, the already known um, uh, risk factors for causation of, or association with uh, invasive uh, fungal infection um, to try and pinpoint the patients who are likely to develop infection. Now, I want to start by asking you about the most well-known um, of these individual prediction scores or prediction rules, and that is the Cristobal Leon, uh, the Spanish Candida score, uh, which um, many of you will be aware of, but may not be entirely familiar with. And so what I want to know from you is which of these following eight risk factors are included uh, in the Leon Candida score? Um, please pick one or more of these. You can have several choices. Okay, well, I hope this reflects what you actually did. Um, so everyone thinks that candida colonization is, is important, and you're absolutely right. TPM, likewise, gets a good vote. Surgery gets a good vote. Um, and immunosuppression gets a good vote. But only a quarter of you remembered that sepsis was actually the fourth, um, fourth of these, these ones here. One, two, three, four. Um, risk factors in this rule. Okay, the rest of them have been shown to be risk factors, but not in the Leon rule. Okay, and this actually shows you the four rules which are current, um, including Didier Pite's uh, Candida Colonization Index, and here is the Leon rule here. And I'm not going to go into these in huge amounts of detail. As you can see, there's loads of detail uh, in order to discuss these. Um, you can see from the sensitivity and specificity of different assessments of these rules, in other words, taking different uh, measurements at different time points, usually, um, that the sensitivity and specificity may range from about 30% um, to even 100%. Um, what you can also see is that they all use different criteria for assessment. So we've got candida colonization for the PTA rule. We have a broad spectrum antibiotic use, diabetes, TPM, and dialysis for the PAFITU rule from 2005. The Leon rule, you just confirmed, sort of, TPM surgery, candida colonization, and sepsis. And for the ostrowski zeitner rule, which is the most recent one, antibiotic usage, CVC usage, surgery, immunosuppression, pancreatitis, TPM, dialysis, and steroid use. Okay, increasingly complex. There are some shortcomings to these rules, as you're probably appreciating. A, they're complex, but also uh, they're based on three, four, five, or even seven days, in some cases, stay in the ICU. And so if you're going to use that for prophylaxis, you've already been there a long time. You've had the chance to start developing infection before you even uh, reach the criteria for prophylaxis. Some are based on colonization, not all. One, of course, is based on sepsis. So I would put it to you that this isn't really about prophylaxis. Many of these models, well, some of these models, are likely to be overfitted because of a small number of events. And what we mean by that is uh, when you overfit a model, it's because a it's, uh, small number of events make things much more optimistic. And so the 29-patient rule uh, of PTE, when it achieved 100% specificity and sensitivity, you suspect that may be overfitted a little bit. They're also, they tend to be of low specificity in most cases, and so you overtreat patients. You tend to treat many more patients in the ICU than you'd wish. And so the FIRE group um, in the UK decided to get together and produce a better rule. Okay, and the first step on this road uh, was a systematic review of risk factors. And you can see lots of lists here, and I'm not going to go through all of these to explain them all to you, but I'll summarize them in, in, in this block here. Um, so from the literature, uh, again and again, significantly, surgery, TPN, candida colonization, 
enteric bacteremia, mechanical ventilation, renal support, diabetes, high Apache 2 scores were recurrent themes in terms of risk factors. And then in individual studies, renal failure rather than necessarily renal support, it's probably the same thing. Antifungal medication as a, a negative predictive value, CVCs and broad spectrum antibiotics come in as well. So actually you can find a lot of significant um, uh, risk factors. So the group then went on to do a prospective study in more than 60,000 patients um, and found, first of all, that the incidence of invasive infection in these patients was 6 per 1,000 um, uh, uh, six per thousand admissions. So very similar to what we saw 10 years earlier in the BSMM study. What has changed, though, is that only about 60% of these infections are caused by Candida albicans now. Remember, it was 80% before. Um, they, the group then went on to do a stepwise selection of variables uh, on admission at 24 hours and after three days. So trying to get in early and try and work out how best to predict infection. Um, not surprisingly, variables differed at different time points. Um, and so, you know, you were, you were looking at different things at 24 hours from when patients were being admitted. And then with this big um, development set, uh, the uh, models were then validated in a separate population subset. Uh, and so you can see 40,000 patients were used to develop the sample, and then the other 20,000 were used uh, to look at random variation, temporal variation, and geographic variation to really try and make this a robust model and a good study. And this is, to cut a very long story short, this is um, a rock analysis of the FIRE um, models uh, on, day, uh, on admission, uh, day one and day three, uh, alongside the other models we talked about, uh, the ostrowski zeichner and the Pafitu models. And you can see that, sadly, none of them are up here, which is where you'd like them to be. Highly sensitive, highly specific. Um, but you can also see that the, the fire study models are much the same as the others, but I put it to you that they're probably more robust. They've been validated in larger numbers of patients. OK, so they're not great, um, but you can see that they can be cost effective if you use fluconazole um, for your prophylactic agent. Um, but it does depend on your risk threshold, how much or how many or how, what high percentage, what proportion of your ICU patients will require to be given antifungal prophylaxis. So if you have a higher incidence, one to 2% risk threshold, um, then about up to 12% will receive fluconazole in your ICU. At a lower risk threshold of 0.5%, then a third of your patients will receive antifungal prophylaxis. And that is, uh, that is a difficult situation to be in, I think, because if you've seen the data, we're more around this sort of uh, risk level in the UK. Um, and it's difficult, therefore, to, to push this hard, I think, when you know that probably a third of your patients will be receiving um, fluconazole. But nevertheless, uh, it is cost effective. So, I want to move on to real life. And I want to ask you um, this question, which has been asked by others, and I'll show you the response in a moment. Which of the following as a single factor is likely to prompt empirical antifungal therapy in your ICU? Because we know out there people are giving antifungal agents because they're not sure, they think this patient may have invasive fungal disease, we're going to give them some treatment. So one of these options will, um, will um, prompt empirical antifungal therapy in your ICU. So you have to select one or more of these and then press send. OK. So the majority would, would use um, an antifungal agent for, for an unresponsive fever. OK. That, I guess, is what we've just been talking about as not being effective, or not being different from placebo anyway. Uh, but, but less adverse effects, of course. Um, and then there's isolation of candida from multiple sites. About three-quarters of you uh, would uh, give empirical therapy in that setting. 
Okay, as a single factor, nothing else involved here. Um, I mean, I can understand why people are thinking that, but let's see what actually the UK's response, oh, sorry, the UK's response to this exact same question, uh, which was asked in a survey by uh, Ajit Bal and Chalmers, um, published just a couple of years ago, um, and they found as a single factor that it was mostly about colonization, that people would be worried when patients became colonized at two or more sites. They'd start to want to give antifungal agents. Uh, but thankfully, only about 10% were giving antifungals for fever with nothing else uh, associated. But once you start to find other factors, then again, not surprisingly, people start to deal in with antifungal agents. And that's exactly what you'd expect, I think. OK, this is all about treatment now. I've got two summary slides of, how, of what other key issues there are about management. Clearly, right at the top, I put diagnostics, but I'm not going to say anything about that. In terms of choice of antifungal agents, when you decide to give treatment, um, we have good evidence in several patient groups for candida infection to treat with an echinocandin. Um, and this appears in a retrospective analysis, at least, to reduce mortality and response um, uh, in candida infection in comparison with fluconazole. We know that timing of therapy should be as early as possible, so we've got to get in early somehow. Uh, we know that duration is usually 14 days for candidemia. That's based on studies and no good comparative data really for shorter duration. Uh, we know that line removal is probably a good thing, and if you can do it, it improves outcome, both in terms of mortality and response in these patients. We know that we should do other things in these patients, like drain abscesses, aspirate, perform surgery, maybe use Well, we have evidence for prophylaxis efficacy now. We have the fact that there's no evidence for fever-based empirical therapy. We have evidence for antifungal choice and line removal, some support for prediction rules for management, but definitely something needing to be done about that because I think we've got to involve diagnostics in this process, and I hope others are going to explain that in, in, in more detail. Um, and of course, these are being bundled up into guidelines and I know that my next speaker, uh, sorry, our next speaker, uh, very good friend and colleague, Mike and Aaron Drupp, is going to.